Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Kevin Cosby here in Louisville, Kentucky, St. Stephen Baptist Church, with another powerful point to ponder as we spend meaningful moments with the Master in the Word of God. Thank you again for joining us as we continue the series on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No success without a test. And that's true. And we're just looking at how these men at the end were promoted, but they had to go through some testing time. The king has set up this golden image of himself and said, everyone must, at the sound of the music, stop whatever they're doing. I don't care what you're doing. When you hear the sound of the music, <laughs> you should get, it's like musical chairs, you know? You got to bow down and worship me. And then when the music stops, then you get back up. Then five minutes later, you know, the music might start again. Suppose it's three o'clock in the morning and the music starts playing. Then that means you got to get up out of bed and you got to get up and worship and bow down and worship this golden idol. In other words, it's compulsory. It's forced worship. You can't force worship. Worship is something that's internal. Worship is something that's just in you that you want to do. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But if you had to make me do this, I wouldn't be glad. I'd be mad. I'd be sad. I wouldn't say I'm glad. I'm, I'm mad that I have to stop what I'm doing and for, being forced to worship a king because he has ego issues and insecurity issues. Well, three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down. They could not bow down because their religion would not let them bow down. They were Hebrews. They were Jews. And these Jews knew that the word of God said that you're not supposed to have any other God before the true and living God. And secondly, you're not supposed to make any graven image of God. And the reason you're not supposed to make any graven image of God is because anytime we try to create God in our image, we always reduce God. We reduce God. We make God small and God cannot be conceptualized. God is beyond our imagination. God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. As far as the heaven is above the earth, so is God's ways above our ways. So the king said, bow down. Everybody bow down. They would not. Their co-workers snitched on them, told the king, because these were men who were prominent, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their 30s, Jews, but they had gone up the ladder in terms of authority. They were in positions of influence in the king's administration. And their co-workers snitched on them because they wanted to take their place. People will do that to you. They'll undermine you. Some people are so aspirational. They have no ethics. They will undermine you and do whatever they have to do in order to displace you. But what God has for you, God has for you. Amen. So the king gives him an ultimatum. He says, you either bow or you will be thrown into the fiery furnace. And then he says, and what God can rescue you? Which means that the king is really challenging the power of God. God. Well, let's see how they respond to the king's second chance for them to bow down and worship the golden idol. Verse 16 says this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve, remember he just asked what God is able to deliver you. And listen to what they say in response. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. So their response is this. First of all, they would not have bow initially. They would not bow initially. And not only would they not bow, they would not bend. King told them, I'm giving you another chance. Uh, and they would not bend. And they won't break. They won't bow. They won't bend. They won't break because they are men of conviction. Men of conviction. Now, uh, how do you respond when powerful people try to pressure you? Believe me, as the president of a historical black college and university, I have to deal 
with philanthropy. And philanthropy, 90% of it is, is white controlled. So all the wealth is in the hands of white America. And if I would bow and bend to the will of philanthropy, which is not in the best interest of black people, then they may give me some crumbs that fall from their table. Uh, you see, power is this. If, 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 if person A is able to make person B do what person B does not want to do, then person A has power over person, per, person B. And it's all about power. Listen to me. You may lose everything, but one thing you should never lose is your dignity. One thing you should never lose is your dignity. Let them take it. Some things are not worth having if you have to lose your dignity in order to have it. Notice how these Hebrew boys responded to the threat of the most powerful man in the world. First of all, they say this. They say, uh, we're not going to defend ourselves. Those in verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Quit thinking that you have to defend yourself or you have to explain to folk your convictions or you got to convince folk uh, of why what you're doing is right. Hear me and hear me good. When people don't want to be convinced, they will not be convinced. So don't try to spend your time convincing somebody who refused to be convinced. If people believe, which, which our society teaches, that black people are inferior and you're trying to prove that, no, I'm not inferior, I can show you what I can do. I don't care if you get a PhD. When they see you a certain way as an inferior person because of your color, there is nothing you can do to convince them of, that, of, of anything otherwise. So don't worry about convincing people who don't want to be convinced. You, it's a waste of emotion, a waste of time. Take them off your mind, forget the king, go on. He says, we're not going to defend ourselves in this matter because it will not make a difference because you've got your mind made up. Second thing I want you to see in this story is not only would they not try to convince people, a person that did not want to be convinced, but they believed in the power of God. While the king diminished God and said, no God will be able to save you, they put their faith in a delivering God. Notice what they say. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able. Our God is able. And everything in the Bible is a testimony to the ableness of God. The God who created everything, God is able. The God who parts red seas, God is able. The God whose wind brings down the walls of Jericho, our God is able. The God who provide manna from on high and brought water out of a rock so that the children of Israel could eat and survive the wilderness. Uh, the God we serve is able. They are affirming that ableness, the omnipotence of God. And when you are in trouble, don't forget God is able. You know God is able because what God has done in your own life. So first of all, they didn't try, not try to convince the king because he could not be convinced. Don't spend your time trying to convince folk who will not be convinced. Secondly, believe in the power of God. Our God is able to save. And then go a step further. Step out on faith and say this. Not only is our God able to save, but say our God will save us. Notice what he says in verse 17. He says two things. If we are thrown into the blazing, into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. Not only believe God is able, believe God's going to do it. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God, but expect great things from God. Expect God to do it. And they expected God to deliver them. But they also know that while God has a perfect will, and that's that they be delivered, God has a permissive will, that God may not will for it to happen. So notice what they say. They, they say that we believe God is able, we believe God will save, but look at verse 18. But even if he does not, even if he does not, 
We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up, which means that they were ready to die. And this is what you have to do. You have to remain loyal to God no matter what the outcome. No matter what the outcome, you say, I'm going to remain loyal to God. And when the king heard this, I mean, the king loses it. I mean, he says, uh, heat up the furnace seven times hotter, seven times hotter than usual. Oh, my God. Now, listen, as I close this teaching, let me let me share something with you. And that is that sometimes God saves us from a crisis. In other words, God could have easily saved them from the crisis by detouring them around the fiery furnace. And sometimes we get saved from some stuff that could have happened, but it didn't happen because God detoured us. We don't know how many times God detoured us around some troubles. We don't know because the trouble never happened. So sometimes God saves us from a fiery furnace by sending us around it. And we didn't even know that we were getting ready to step in the fiery furnace. That's how God delivers. And then sometimes God saves us not from the crisis or the fiery furnace. God saves us through the crisis, which is to say that God lets us go through something, but we come out of it. We come out of it. We eventually go through it, but we come out. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes God saves us from the crisis. Sometimes God saves us through the crisis. And then sometimes God saves us by the crisis. In other words, we have the crisis and the crisis saves us. In other words, the furnace actually does something for us. The furnace we've been thrown in that we don't like being is, is the thing that God's going to use to promote us. And we're sitting there angry because we got the furnace. We're in the furnace saying, God, I thought you were going to deliver us. And God says, I am, but I'm going to use the furnace to help promote you. I'm going to bless you in the midst of it. Sometimes God will let us experience a low level crisis to prevent a high level crisis. I remember I have a parishioner here at St. Stephen Church. She had a new car. She has a car accident. Somebody runs into her car and she, her car is damaged, but more importantly, she's got problems. She's turning her neck. And she's upset because her neck is hurting and the car has, it, it's, it's a new car, is, is in damage, has been damaged. So she goes to the hospital and uh, the hospital, they check her out. And guess what? To her unbeknownst, she had such high blood pressure that she was at stroke level. And they admitted her to the hospital. She had this blood pressure problem and didn't know it. And they admitted her to the hospital, not because she had a bad neck, but because she had blood pressure problems. Which is to say that the car accident was bad. Yeah, the neck hurting is bad. But if she had not had the car accident, and if her neck had not hurt, then she was a candidate for stroke and death, which means that God used one crisis to save her from a bigger crisis that she didn't see. And sometimes God will save us by sending us around the furnace. Sometimes God will get us through the furnace. Then God will say, I'm going to let you spend some time in the furnace because I'm going to use this furnace time to promote you. Hallelujah. And sometimes God will let some crisis that seems big at the time happen to avert some bigger crisis later on. And we don't see it. And that's why we have to be patient and trust God. So don't forget, don't try to defend yourself against people who don't won't hear you. Believe God can save you. Our God is able. Believe God will do it. But if not, be a person of conviction not of convenience and say, we will not bow. We will not bow and we will not bend and we will not break. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today and bless your people. Bless your people, especially someone who is hurting right now and needed to hear this word today in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you. Thank you so much for being with me. Another powerful point to ponder. Look, if you don't have a church home, I'd like to extend an invitation to you to become a part of St. Stephen Church. Contact us here at St. Stephen Church. Email us, new start, new start at ssclive.org, and we'll get right back with you. Look, we'll pick up on this thing tomorrow, but until then, during COVID-19, stay safe, stay sane, and don't forget, God is still in control. I'll see you tomorrow.